Hello and welcome to Giving Ventures, a podcast to help you grow your giving and change the world for the better. Each episode, we share innovative charitable efforts leveraging private philanthropy to solve public problems. I'm your host, Peter Lipset, Vice President at Donors Trust. This show is a product of Donors Trust, the oldest and largest donor advised fund focused on helping conservative and libertarian donors of all capacities simplify, protect, and grow their giving. My colleagues and I talk with a lot of groups doing great work. This show lets us share a bit of what we learn with you so you can discover new projects for your own philanthropy. You hear many donors, thought leaders, even teachers lamenting the degraded quality of what you might loosely call social studies, the teaching of civics and history and economics in our schools. These were my favorite subjects growing up, but today they face a dual problem. One is just how much measurement in schools goes into math and reading, leading to social studies to kind of get the short end of the stick. Couple that with the second problem of increased politicization of these topics and polarization and you have room for despair. You also, however, have room for innovation, and today we will talk with two groups creatively attacking these problems. Our first guest, PragerU, is one you may have heard of before and may have even seen some of their cutting-edge videos. More under the radar is Sirtel, but I think you will be fascinated by its unique approach to getting unbiased social studies content into the hands of thousands of high school teachers across the country, as well as its new, unique college initiative, The two are different in their approach, but you'll find some important similarities, not least of which is a pragmatic, ego-free approach to creating content that works. These interviews are a little bit longer than I normally do, but both have so much going on, well, I don't think you'll mind. Without further ado, let's get to it. Prager University Foundation, better known to many of us as Prager U, promotes American values through a myriad of educational videos. Its videos are viewed more than 5 million times each day, and who knows, that number may be out of date at this point, and the team pumps out new videos every single day. It is just a content creation machine unparalleled on the right, and PragerU CEO Marissa Strait is here with me to help us understand why it is so successful and what that future looks like. So Marissa, PragerU has a lot going on. Is there a succinct way to sum up what your mission is, what you're doing? So thank you for having me on. Uh, The best way to understand what we're doing here at PragerU is that we are aiming to disrupt the current education system that has failed America's students and has failed Americans in general. It has actually succeeded in what it was probably aimed to do, uh, which is to become uh, a left-wing propaganda machine, uh, but it has not succeeded in what Americans want it to do. And so as we've been looking at America's education system, and we are wondering why our young Americans unable to think critically and work hard and love their country, if you actually notice what we've been teaching young Americans, we've been teaching them to hate America. We've been teaching them uh, that equity over equality is what they should strive for. Uh, All of these things that we have been teaching them is why we're in this situation today. And so we consider PragerU as medicine for the mind. And what we want to do is try to get this medicine out to as many people as possible so that we can save young American minds. And we use the power of the internet. Uh, Everybody, almost everybody in America has access to the internet, whether it's through an iPad or a phone or a computer or, or a smart TV. And so PragerU shows up everywhere with medicine for the mind so that we can cure and help people think clearly. So the concern was so much media that bends towards American values, limited government, et cetera, et cetera, is that the only people watching it are already in the choir. So who is watching your videos and how do you know you're really changing minds? How do you know you're really speaking to that middle Okay, so let me talk about the three groups that we talk about here in our marketing sessions at PragerU. So PragerU is, is, we spend more money actually on marketing than production, and that is our secret sauce. We realized very early on that what is the point of building a beautiful car if you never put any gasoline in it? It never leaves the garage and you never really enjoy it and really don't reap the benefits of it. So PragerU, um, the PragerU team understood early on that we need to make great productions, 
but there is no point in making a great production if we don't market it. So we market to basically three audiences. And let me start with the first audience, which is where some criticism comes uh, from. They say, well, are you preaching to the choir? And to that, my answer is yes. We are also preaching to the choir. We are not only preaching to the choir, but we are also preaching to the choir. And let me tell you why. The choir has forgotten the tune. Look at the conservative movement. It is abysmal. It's in shambles. We have no clear leadership. We have no clear direction. We don't know what we believe in anymore. Uh, everybody's attacking one another. I'm not even sure that conservatives, young conservatives, really understand what America stands for. And part of it is because we have not educated our very own children in what they need to know and in, in what America is about. So yes, we are not bashful. We are not bashful about teaching to the choir because our choir needs to know the tune so that they can go and sing it loud and proud. Now, the second group that people would talk about is, are we changing minds on the left, the Bernie Sanders supporters? Are we getting to them? Are we changing their minds? And I would say to that, sometimes it's not our in entire focus, but for those who are familiar with Prager U personalities, We've had two young personalities that have worked for us that were actually BLM activists, and they were social justice warriors. Our most recent hire, uh, Xavier de Rousseau, was the head of Black Lives Matter in Northern California. And he was actually casted for a Netflix show where he was supposed to represent BLM, and he quickly realized that in order to represent BLM, he better go study up. And so what do people do when they study up on something? They go to Google, he Googled Black Lives Matter, and one of our targeted ads showed up and he happened to stumble upon a bunch of our videos. And I quote Xavier when, when I say this, he accidentally red-pilled himself by binge watching PragerU. So it does happen that we change minds. Um, it doesn't happen every single day and we can't change every mind, but it does happen because we do target an audience that has not already watched our videos. It's part of our, our marketing plan. And the, the part that I want to focus on the most in my answer is that 33%, the people in the middle, the possible classical liberals, or what we call them um, politically homeless, not quite sure, but something rubs them the wrong way. And that's an audience that we have been very focused on reaching and we've been very successful at reaching through what we call uh, uh, ambassador causes. Causes that we realize that are impacting people directly and if we specifically explain it to them in a way that would resonate with them, they would wake up and engage. And so here are some examples. The Gender Affirming Care uh, initiative that has come uh, through many of the schools and, and the medical society, telling kids that they should transition at an early age, right? Start taking medication at age 11, 12, 13, and, and do the medical castrations by age 16, right? Many, many parents are waking up to that. That is an ambassador marketing cause. This is something that a lot of people relate to, whether they're political or not. So we have a bunch of those kinds of uh, causes that we take on realizing that whether they're classical liberal or politically homeless or that 33% resonates with and oftentimes wakes up. And so, you know, at first glance, they'll Google PragerU and they'll read whatever the New York Times lies about us, but then they'll head over to PragerU and say, I actually kind of agree with some of these things. They make sense. And they then subscribe or we retarget them marketing wise. And eventually some of them, many of them join our cause. What ages are you particularly going after? I know there's a whole Prager U kids. You're, you're ta the way you're talking, it sounds like it's really after that school age kid, maybe into college, maybe even like younger Gen Z. How high? How low? What is that range? So at, we are a media company. We define ourselves as edutainment, educational entertainment, or you can call it broccoli for your brain. So places like Netflix, which I think of as Cheetos, where sometimes you want a, a few of those bites, uh, but if you eat too much of it, you feel like garbage. At PragerU, you can consume as much as possible and feel great. As an edutainment platform, our goal is to actually serve everyone. When you go to church, you grab your child in one hand, you grab your parents in the other hand, and you all walk in, and there is, there is in, in a ministry, there is room for everyone. And that has been our vision as well. And in many ways, we are like an inter internet ministry, right? And, and, and so we have a room for every segment of the population. We make content for four years old, 
all the way to 104. And, and we start early because we realize that left-wing onslaught propaganda starts cradle to grave. And we want to make sure that everybody is engaged. And once we engage, we don't want to lose anybody, right? We are so focused on marketing. The reason when, when you read the type of uh, numbers that we're reaching, right, our impact is because that is what we focus on. We focus on constant engagement, constant retention, and constant growth. And in order to maintain the retention and the growth, we have to create products for every single style and every single age so that we keep compiling and growing as our audience matures and grows. Are there lessons from all you do? I mean, maybe it's the marketing, maybe it's in the production, uh, maybe just the way you talk about these things that are good lessons that other conservative groups trying to get broader penetration should take. I mean, a lot of think tanks, a lot of different groups are trying to create films, create things. Some of them get traction. Many of them don't go anywhere. What kind of lessons and replicable success that you've seen is, is available to them? So I would say that the first thing is that we run PragerU not like a nonprofit. We run it like a real business. And in and, and a business, when you, when you want to do great things, you have to do bold things, and you have to really think differently. Every time I meet with my senior team, I say, if you see a wall, I want you to look at the wall and find a crack, not do things the way people have done it before. But in order to disrupt the market, you have to create something that's 10x in order for people to find value in it. Uh, we have to really leave our ego at the door and not say, well, we've been doing this for so many years, and this is how we're used to thinking but actually be willing to do things entirely different and differently, willing to run against the herd, experiment. And I'll give you a very specific example, what I mean by that. About 12 years ago, when we started PragerU, we started making these videos and we started putting a lot of money behind those videos and people mocked me. They mocked me because they would say, well, why do you have to put so much money behind your videos? If your videos are good, people will just wa want to watch them and they will share them, right? Well, why, are you, why do you need to market? Why do you need to force feed the content if the content is so good, right? We would run pre-roll on YouTube. We would run uh, all of these ads all over YouTube. We'd spend so much money on that and people mocked me. And I feel a little like that character. I don't know if you, uh, this is a bit, a bit of a girl thing, but there's, there's the movie Pretty Woman when, uh, when Julia Roberts walks back into that store on Rodeo Drive, which is with a bunch of bags in her hand. And she's like, big mistake, huge. Right. So I, <laughs> I feel a little like that because, you know, I, we were right about that. We were right about putting our ego at the door and saying, no, if Coca Cola is advertising their garbage drink, then conservatives should advertise their incredible ideas. And I think that is the type of thinking that has really catapulted PragerU. And we, we are doing the same thing now with PragerU kids in schools. We, we are just willing to do things so differently. We are willing to go into areas that um, other groups haven't gone before. And it's scary and it's uncertain. And sometimes there isn't a very clear business plan that, you know, can outline exactly what we're going to be doing over the next five years. But, you know, you know, my background, my background is technology. Technology is willing to do things and try new things that you may not know what the final, final journey is going to look like, but you know what your goals are. As long as you know what your goal are, goals are, you know what your destination is, you, you need to be comfortable with doing some twists and turns while doing it. And I think that is something that is not so uh, common amongst conservative nonprofits. I think more of them are starting to do that, um, but we have to be willing to take some risks and 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 try to do things, um, you know, take advantage of technology and do things really differently and and get really uncomfortable. Right? That's how great things happen: taking risks and getting uncomfortable. I call it the libertarian conundrum, this belief that our ideas are just so self-evident that everyone's going to come and then mm -hmm. nobody comes. And so we talk to ourselves more about how our ideas are so great. Yeah, the ivory towers. One place that, that you actually are very common to a lot of conservative groups is is uh, getting canceled and having videos pulled off YouTube. And that was quite quite the thing in the history of PragerU. You had a pretty public fight with YouTube over a few particular videos and lawsuits haven't always gone your way, but you haven't given up the fight, which I think is important. Is this censoring still a problem? Is it still hurting the way you're, you're doing stuff or is it 
have you been able to to ride it out? Censorship is still a problem. It's an, actually a bigger problem. And so for those listening and want some context, in 2016, we actually sued YouTube for censoring a bunch of our videos, many of our videos uh, based on ideological discrimination. You know, I mentioned that we, we, we speak against gender affirming care. Those videos almost are always censored. We, we have a video uh, from the ten, that Dennis has made on the Ten Commandments, supposedly because it has the word murder in it, as in do, you shall not murder. That video was censored. Uh, Victor Davis Hansen has done a magnificent videos for us on the Vietnam War uh, and in and, and other wars. Those videos have been censored. Uh, a lot of our videos on Israel have been censored. And so we realized early on that there has been this view, viewpoint discrimination and we sued YouTube. Um, the YouTube is not the only problem. Actually, Facebook is a bigger problem. We had problems with Twitter until recently when Elon Musk, uh, you know, changed the rules and, and, and allowed us to show up again. Uh, the issues with censorship continue. I'm actually releasing a video next week about NewsGuard, which is a political tool to censor media across the board. People really need to know about NewsGuard and we can dive into it deeper at another time or, or later. Um, and I will say that it is a problem, uh, but we have learned how to take lemon and turn it into lemonade. And, and so with us being very bold about the problem and bringing awareness to the problem, it actually has brought more attention to us because when people realizing when people are realizing that there's stuff out there that they want to know and they should know and they deserve to know, they start looking for it. And so people have started looking for PragerU content. They have started following us directly. Our website visits has increased. Our our email subscribership has increased. Our even our social media subscribership has increased since censorship happened. So is it a problem? Yes. Have we learned how to work around censorship? Yes, because that's what we do. When we see a wall, we only see the cracks. I will make sure to put the link to that NewsGuard video in our uh, write-up about this podcast. It'll probably be released by the time this podcast is out, and so people can watch that. I've heard you talk about the NewsGuard thing in the past, and uh, yeah, it's it's a little frightening, and it's a little just, it's frustrating. It makes you want to put some cracks in that wall with your head. Um <laughs> Maybe your biggest recent win is that PragerU was officially allowed to be used in schools in Florida, and I think more states are coming down the pike, uh, hopefully. So what does that what does that really mean, particularly because your materials are free for anybody to use? So what does it mean to be incorporated into the Florida curriculum? Yeah, so uh, a little bit about my background. I'm actually an educator. So I taught K through seventh grade in California, the belly of the beast. I have a master's in education. I ran a school myself. Uh, when we started PragerU, as I mentioned, I wanted to disrupt the education market. And I always thought it would be only done from without. I said, let's be the Uber of education. Everybody has a screen. Let's get people directly. Let's tell parents that they should be involved in their children's education and therefore they need to inoculate them in the afternoons and on the weekends and teach them what ought to be taught. That has always been the mission of PragerU. It continues to be the mission of PragerU. It's my core belief that parents must be involved in their children's education. Even if they can't homeschool them, they can still school them at home. Uh, but this past summer, as we kept staring at the, that wall that is built around uh, America's students, held hostage by the teachers' unions and all those uh, left with, left-wing uh, indoctrination centers, I would say, we finally started seeing some cracks. And we realized that we can actually create another journey for our viewership, another journey for our customer, and that is in the schools. It started with Florida. We spoke with the Department of Education there, and we said, hey, we realize that you allow supplementary content in the schools. And I'll give you an example. Brain Pop makes videos for kids that are used in schools on a daily basis. Scholastic, many listeners might be familiar with Scholastic. It's been around for a long time. They make supplementary education that are in schools across the United States. And there are many other education vendors that make supplementary content. I remember when I was a teacher, I would give, I would be given broad stroke curriculum. I was told, okay, well, you need to teach, let's say, the War of 1812, or you need to teach children how to read and they need to read chapter books, right? But if you think about it, 
so much of the lesson itself is actually these supplementary pieces that teachers are finding, whether through P teacher pay teachers, or they find it online, or they use Brain Pop, or they use Scholastic in order to execute their lesson plan. And so when we realized that, we said, well, we're putting all this pressure on the schools, rightfully so, to get the garbage out, to stop with, with content that we don't want in there. But what can we give teachers to put in instead? Right? And so even when the curriculum is approved, and either, even when we get these incredible people on school boards that are advocating for patriotic education, we need to give them resources of what they can bring into the classroom instead of what I call the garbage. Now, as much as I would love them to use the McGuffey readers, the McGuffey readers look a little old, but we need McGuffey reader type of content, right? Though they haven't, we haven't used in the United States the McGuffey readers since the, what, 1960s? Uh, but we need good stuff and it needs to look new. It needs to look colorful and exciting. We need to use AI and video and current tools to teach children uh, lifelong values, right? And so we started making this content and we started partnering with the different states. And so we called up the, de the Department of Education in Florida and we said, how do we serve you? We know that you don't want the bad stuff. How do we serve you? What are you teaching that you are hearing from teachers that they need help with? And they, their answer was, you know, financial literacy is really important to us. Americans are not learning financial literacy. Civics. Americans are not learning civics. Most kids can't pass the naturalization test. They don't, they can't pass the citizenship test. So can you help us make great, fun, exciting content that can be turnkey lesson plans for teachers to use? And we said, yeah, we know how to do that. We have educators here on staff. We have a, a cutting edge production team. Many of them uh, have escaped Hollywood to come work for us. We can certainly do that. And so we created a financial literacy module. Uh, we create, we're, we're working on civic shows and we basically said, we, let's echo the state standards and make stuff that's really exciting so that teachers will want to use our content. And if you can approve it as, as an education vendor, then teachers will feel comfortable and become aware of the content, uh, available for them. And it was, you know, we worked very quickly. It's the PragerU fashion. We just kind of get into that airplane and we, we build it while we're flying in it. And eventually, uh, you know, eventually we have safe landings, thank God. Uh, but we started with Florida and we, we went to additional states and we said the same thing. Hey, we're doing this. How do we serve? How do we serve your teachers? How do we serve your, your students? And uh, we found that many of the things that we've already been doing are actually very helpful to these states. And so Oklahoma welcomed us, and we had uh, uh, an announcement with Texas, and we did Montana recently, and one of the more exciting ones, I would say, is New Hampshire. New Hampshire now gives high school credit to students that complete our financial literacy model. Oh, wow. uh, this all happened this past summer alone. So we're just getting started. We're looking to make it into additional states. Also, anybody listening, if you have any connections with any of the you know, major schools, whether public or private, if you know any of the superintendent or state commissioners, if you can put in a good word where you want wholesome patriotic education in, in, in your communities, uh, please advocate for, for our content to be in your, in your space. So what is next for PragerU? What is this next phase of growth going to look like? Yeah, so uh, we focused a lot of, uh, in this conversation about PragerU kids, uh, but just as a reminder, we are here to serve the entire community. So again, I, I repeat, we make edutainment, educational entertainment for four years old all the way to 104. One of the new initiatives that we are pushing uh, very quickly our staff to work on are these short documentaries. They're about 20 minutes long. Uh, they're deep in education, but they're also very entertaining. And they're great for, I would say, anybody 16 years old and up. And our next documentary that is coming out actually within the next few weeks is called D-Trans. And really it tells the story of the dangers of gender affirming care. And so you're hearing this, this brainwashing from an early age that a child should, may have been born in the wrong body and, and maybe they should not be a boy even though we're born a boy. Maybe they want to identify as a girl. And if it ended with that, that would be problematic. But it, it has become so sick that we, we are now allowing children to make lifelong decisions. Many of these decisions are devastating. And so 11, 12, 13-year-olds are taking hormones, creating irreversible damage to their bodies because, you know, physicians 
and folks in the medical industry have been told that they have to administer that. And it doesn't end with the hormones. Many of them are actually going under what I call surgical castrations. They're removing their breasts and, and oftentimes their genitalia. And these are minors who are making these decisions. And so you would only imagine what happens when they make these decisions and a few years later, they realize that they made a huge mistake and they change their mind. And at that point, the damage to their body is irrevocable. And so when I'll tell you that when Twitter opened up and people were actually allowed to speak against this, many, many young people have started tweeting that they were brainwashed and they were influenced to undergo these medical castrations and these uh, hormone treatments, and they regret it. And when they were trying to speak against it about their experience on social media, they were censored. And I did an interview with a young girl named Chloe Cole uh, less than a year ago. And Chloe told her story about how this st her journey started when she was 11 years old. She was a quirky little kid who didn't quite fit in. And so they encouraged her to take hormones. And then they encouraged her to wear a binder around her breast and to identify as a boy. By the time she was 15 or 16 years old, she went into surgery. And by the time she was 17 years old, she was already detransitioning. She changed her mind because she realized that she did want to become a mother one day. Wow. And after I, I released the interview with Chloe, I got dozens and dozens of emails from other children who have decided to detransition and nobody was there for them. And so we decided to actually do a documentary about it and we are going to be releasing it in the next few weeks. And in, in 20 minutes, I think this is going to be eye-opening for Americans to see what is happening to our youth? Well, there's so much good stuff sure to come out of PragerU. You're always innovating, finding those cracks, as you say. Marissa, I appreciate you going through all this with us today and keep it up. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Being a teacher is hard. I live with one and I don't understand how they do it. Many would argue that it is even harder today in an era with the internet and cell phones and just this infinite river of 10-second video snacks available at all times. And because of all that noise, thousands of teachers of history, and civics, and social studies are extremely grateful for Sertel. Sertel offers unbiased and media-rich content to let teachers help their students learn how to think, not train them on what to think. Fred Franson has been an important voice and entrepreneur in education philanthropy for decades and founded and leads Sertel and its group of innovative projects. Fred, let, let's start with that, that kind of catchphrase that I've heard you say of helping teachers frame up how to think, not what to think. I don't disagree with it, but, you know, especially in grade school and high school, don't the kids uh, need to know what to think as well in terms of facts? No, that that's absolutely true. Um, and in fact, it, maybe the phrase is a, a slightly misleading in terms of what we contribute versus what we're asking teachers to contribute. So my educational philosophy is that education is about transmitting four things, knowledge, skills, wisdom, and motivation. And only teachers can do motivation. Um, but the thing about digital technology it is, a, is it allows um, somebody other than the teacher to focus on transmitting knowledge and skills, and skills to a lesser degree, but especially knowledge. So what we try to do is provide knowledge-rich curriculum uh, and projects and assignments and things like that that teachers can give to their students in a way that's going to allow the teacher not to focus on transmitting knowledge because we're doing the heavy lifting for them in that. And then they can focus on what I call wisdom or critical thinking or all kinds of other things. Uh, and there are a few um, you know, nuances to that. So first of all, that guarantees that students that are using our materials will get unbiased facts and knowledge that they can then use to agree with their teacher, deepen what the teacher is saying, to undermine their teacher, to criticize the teacher, to say, wait a second, that's not true. Here's the reference for why it's not true. And so, but, but our goal is to help teachers to not have to focus on teaching facts because we're doing that for them. And then they can use the classroom time for the thing that really only happens in a human environment. Um, in which teachers can focus on discussion, they can focus on project-based learning, they can make the classroom more interactive in all kinds of ways, focus on discussion, because we've taken care of the facts. So give our listeners a sense of 
these materials and the curriculum and what is it that you're actually supplying to the teachers? So we provide four comprehensive course packages in the subjects that most states require for high school social studies. So the rules on what's required and the labels are sometimes different in states, um, but by and large, most states either require or encourage students to take a full year of world history, sometimes they call it geography, they have other names for it, uh, what some Western civilization or world civilization, but in any case, to learn about the world, a year of American history, and then a semester of government and either a semester or a year of economics. And so we provide comprehensive digital course packages that are free to teachers. They're very expensive for us to create, but they're free to teachers and for students uh, that they can use in their classroom. And when I say comprehensive, it includes a digital textbook that, that's illustrated with pictures. Um, m m money are maybe largely drawn from the Library of Congress's incredible collection. Um, and then videos that we embed into the curriculum to help students, digital age students especially, uh, engage with, with the material. And then interactive features like test your understanding, understanding questions, um, quizzes, uh, sample tests, discussion questions, um, classroom assignments, project based learning assignments. So a teacher who wants to only use our materials has everything they need to, for the entire semester or the entire year of the class. And it's all available for them uh, to use for free. And then on top of that, we've just recently released an, a dashboard that allows teachers who have their students directly using the materials to understand what their, their students are doing when they're working on their own. Did they read the assignment? Did they watch the video? Did they get the quiz questions right that are about the video or about the reading assignment and so forth? So we also provide teachers with tools to evaluate whether the class is prepared or who in the class is prepared if, for instance, they say, watch this video, read this section, and tomorrow we're going to start right away with discussion, well, that only works if you know who did their homework. And we've created tools so teachers can, uh, can monitor whether their students have done their, done their homework as well. Did I see, am I getting this right, that you've incorporated some elements of like pop culture, et cetera, into to this? Or is that a separate yeah. project? No, 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 absolutely. So the video that we use, um, uh, we believe is all... A, properly being used according to what's called educational fair use. So um, one of the real challenges that teachers have these days, one is that they're being asked to create their own curriculum. You know, schools are no longer as interested in buying expensive textbooks now that teachers have the internet available to them and they, you know, why shouldn't a teacher create his or her own curriculum? Um, but the other thing is how do you get students who are competing with, um, you know, TV and Hollywood and, you know, high production value content that they have sitting underneath their desk that they can be looking at and watching all the time. So rather than, you know, I have a lot of objections to learning that way. I have a great books education. I think everybody should read Dostoevsky probably every year because you'll never understand it until you've read it 20 times. But that's not the world in which we live. Uh, the world in which we live in is one in which pop culture really matters. And so what we've done is we bring in young people, mostly college students, each summer, and we say to them, what TV shows are you watching or what are your, your younger siblings watching? And then we teach them the concepts that we are embedding in the material or that, are, that the material is discussing. And we say, now go out and find an episode of Seinfeld, you know, not Seinfeld because they don't watch Seinfeld, but uh, out of, say, Parks and Recreation, where one of the storylines touches on this question, let's say, of rent-seeking in government. And then we extract that uh, rent-seeking lesson out of the TV show and we embed it in the curriculum. And that work of identifying things that students are already already watching for entertainment, identifying what are the, you know, the the underlying concepts that are informing what the writers of the TV shows and the movies are are, are writing about, and then mapping that into the content. And that's that's really our our secret sauce is being able to do that well because it seems like an easy exercise, but go out and try to you know choose three topics, and go out and try to remember you know, an episode from a TV show that a 16-year-old is watching uh, that is going to touch on those things. And so we, we, we do that, and then we make that all available to, to teachers. And to do that iteratively every year and bringing in, yeah, because what, what Fred Franson remembers, what Peter Lipset remembers, is not necessarily going to be in the cultural milieu of yeah. today. Uh, that, that's clever. So, so how deep are you penetrating? I mean, part and parcel to that, is it just public schools that Sertel is after? So we have registered on our website uh, by now about 45,000 teachers. Teachers, I pay, put in quotes. And um, that's since 2015. 
Um, now there's a lot of turnover and, um, and we've grown rapidly. Uh, so we're not currently working with 45,000 teachers, but I think we, we're certainly working with more than 10,000 and I think it, the number's probably closer to 20,000 because some of the earlier subscribers we weren't able to track and so they're using our materials, they're just not uh, actively on our website right now. But, but certainly we can document more than 10,000 teachers are using our materials. Um, last summer we did a, a study of exactly where they are and who are they um, and, uh, and so first, our teachers are evenly distributed according to the demographics of the country. So we have the most teachers in, Colorado, in California, then, and then it goes New York, Florida, Texas, Illinois. So the largest states are the places where we have the most teachers. Um, likewise, uh, I believe about 88% uh, um, of teachers in the country are in public schools. We have about 88 or 89% of our teachers are in public schools. Of the remaining 12%, about half are in Catholic schools and half are in non-Catholic private schools, whether religious or non-religious. We've got, of our remaining teachers, about half are Catholic, half are non-Catholic private. So we mapped that. And we only, last summer, were be able to, to really closely track homeschool uh, parents who register as a teacher. We, but we, call them a, we call them a teacher, but they register as a homeschooling family. Um, and uh, lo and behold, about 10 or 11 percent of the country is, of, this, of students are being homeschooled, and about 10 or 11 percent of our new uh, uh, teachers are, are identifying themselves as homeschool. So we've, we've almost uh, perfectly mapped the, the demographics of, of the teacher world. Um, there are about 160,000 high school social studies teachers in the country, and we're again working with, uh, let's say, about one in eight of those today. Do you view other programs as, you know, quote unquote, the competition? Like, what is the competition? And is there a path to getting essentially into all of those systems? So on, one, on the one hand, the competition is, you know, Pearson, McGraw-Hill, Cengage, the, the commercial textbook publishers. Um, uh, that's who we, we view as our competition in terms of quality and, and reach and, uh, and so on. Uh, we, we kind of model ourselves after them. You know, obviously, we can outcompete them on price. Uh, and if you look at the way in which they're operating, you can tell that they, those companies, uh, for-profit companies, recognize that, you know, the price of textbooks is going to converge down to near zero or zero because uh, so much free material is available. So that's one set of, of, of competition. And then um, there are other organizations uh, who are, are, are what I would call friendly competition. Um, Bill of Rights Institute, Free to Choose Network through its isit.org brand, Fee.org, Fee, the Foundation for Economic Education, where I'm on the board, um, is working with teachers. Uh, the Foundation for Teaching Economics, which is part of the Fund for American Studies, we're we're all in kind of the same field. The difference is uh, is that you know we began with providing comprehensive material. Um, I think you know some of the Bill of Rights Institute in particular has started developing comprehensive textbooks, but but w that's kind of where we we operate as opposed to niche materials. And then, uh, uh, likewise, uh, our ability to embed popular culture video and, and the way in which we do that, I think, is, is unique. Um, and it's a part of our unique value proposition. That's what teachers really appreciate about what we do. So Sertel, as I've really come to understand, is really a group of connected projects. I mean, you have, we've just been talking about one of those projects, uh, which has a, its own brand name, right? Yeah, we, Poptential is what we call the curriculum. Poptential. So that's the curriculum side, but you also have a growing prison education program. Uh, you've got some survey capability to understand how to do some of this stuff. We're not going to dive into those, although I encourage people to look at those on the website. But let's talk about the newest project, this Huntington Junior College, which offers a new model for how to clean up higher education, for lack of a better way of saying it. Tell us about that. Sure. Well, it's not unconnected to the, the prison program. So just a, sec a word on that uh, is we've been operating a civics education program for people, incarcerated uh, individuals, for about six or seven years. And um, uh, in order to scale that, we have, uh, are in the process of getting uh, approval to participate in the Pell, Pell, Pell Crow program so that we can get uh, federal aid for uh, inmates in prison. Uh, that most of them can't afford anything else, and uh, and so we're we're using the college as a way of accessing student uh, student aid money. Um, likewise, Sertel has over the years offered professional development courses for teachers, 
Um, but the business model for doing that was always tricky. And so one of our goals, our longer term goals with the college is to um, to begin offering professional development to teachers that's, that, that gives them a graduate credit uh, as well. So we can be teachers, teach, helping teach the teachers how to teach uh, as well as providing them with materials. But the college in and of itself is uh, what we acquired was a for-profit uh, two-year um, uh, career college. Uh, we were able to successfully make it, uh, convert it into a nonprofit college, which is a, a complicated thing. There's a lot of resistance to, to that happening uh, in the world. Uh, and so we were able to navigate that to, exceed, to succeed in, in, in doing that in record time, actually, uh, faster than any other conversion of a, of a proprietary college took place. And we're now in the process of scaling it up. And you know, on the general topic that, that you raised at the beginning about civic education, um, we've done a lot of revision to the catalog. But one of the key things we did is we created a required civic certificate that all, all students, whether they're studying to be a medical assistant or a dental assistant or an entrepreneur in, in a business program, they all have to take a core set of civics courses. Um, and if you ever change a course catalog, or if you happen to be in college when the catalog was revised, you'll know that students who had started their degree under one catalog and then there's a new catalog get to choose. Do they continue and finish under the original catalog or do they want to change to the new catalog? When we introduced the civic certificate, we had a lot of students switch to the new catalog specifically because they wanted to take those civics courses. And what's also interesting is that among employers, um, because this is a career college, I've talked to dentists and people that work in medical offices and hospitals and you know, what is it that you're looking for in our graduates? And what was really, really eye-opening to me, uh, and this is contrary to what, you, what the conversation is about career education, is they weren't saying we need skills training or job, people who are job ready. What they said is, we can train people how to lay out the instruments on a dental tray. We can train people how to do, do, do other kinds of things. What we can't train and what we can't find are people who show up for work, people who um, work hard when they're at work, people who take pride in their job, uh, and then finally, people who are able to deal with adversity when a customer or a patient is unhappy. They don't come running to the dentist and say, fix this, I, I don't know what to do with this woman or this man who's yelling at me at the front desk. Instead, they're able to take on the challenges and engage in the kind of critical thinking we started with. So the civic certificate is really helping with that. We're building other things about professional growth and how to be a successful adult and a human and a citizen as well into all of our programs. So that's kind of what we're doing conceptually. We've added, we've made our two-year business degree into uh, a strong entrepreneurship program, and we're in the process of creating, um, a get, we're, we're seeking approval for a new two-year liberal arts degree, what we're calling classical liberal arts, which will focus on great books and classic texts and classic ideas from, from Western civilization. Uh, and so we think we can create uh, what we're calling the best two year, first two years of college. So even though we only offer associate's degree, we want to become the place where everybody wants to go and spend their first two years. In person or is it a, an online model? No, we're going to build it around a hybrid model. So students will be studying online for, we're on the quarter system. So every 11 week quarter, in 10 of those weeks, students will be working online with a lot of personalized instruction from their instructors. Um, but one weekend in that quarter, they will participate in an in-person residential seminar. So the shorthand for that for me is like Imagine Liberty Fund. Um, if you've ever been to a Liberty Fund Socratic seminar that starts Thursday and it's in a nice place and it's a deeply engaging small group discussion experience. We want to have all of our students have that. We're going to start with a liberal arts program. It's going to have that as a core, but we want that to include how our business students and our medical assisting students and how they they, they learn as well, because we think this hybrid model is much better than just online, and it's much more um, efficient than just, just in person. Um, and we're going to scale this. That's the, that's one, the last thing, if I, if I may. The last that was, that was going to be my question. Is, is, yeah. How do you scale it? What do you do? So um, when, we, when we started off, I took over the school in March of 2022, and enrollment was, had been on a precipitous fall, and it continued to fall the first quarter that we were involved. So at the end of the summer, we had 88 students returning. The college typically had had three to 500 students uh, over the last 20 years. Um, uh, we just uh, launched the fall quarter a couple of weeks ago, and I believe we had 211 students to start the fall quarter. So we've more than doubled 
uh, enrollment in uh, in a little over a year and a half. Now, when I was first starting Sertel, I would say we've doubled enrollment twice. And people would say, yeah, but you started with 50 teachers, and so that's no big deal. Well, okay, so in 2015, we had, let's say, 100 teachers. Uh, we've now got 45,000. So we, I, I know what it means to grow things exponentially, and we think that we can continue to, to do so. I was just looking today at, at other institutions. If you look at uh, University of Phoenix, it was 100,000 students in 25 years. If you look at Liberty University, it was over 100 and over 100,000 students in about 20 years. Uh, Western Governors University, WGU, uh, is now over 200,000 students in about 20, in, in less than 30 years. So if you can create an innovative model, you can price it right, and you can identify a better way of doing things, which is what, for, for your target audience, which is what these schools have done, we think that we can be, um, uh, you know, 5,000 or 10,000 students in, in, uh, in 10 years is very realistic. To wrap all this up, project out a few years, if we update this conversation in five years, where is Sertel? We need more resources uh, in order to continue to grow. The, the, you know, the bigger we get, the harder it is to, to grow. Um, but we would like to be reaching 50% of the teachers uh, in the United States with our material. Not reaching. We would like to have 50% of the teachers in the United States using our materials. Um, and we think that's realistic if we can, uh, if we can simply continue to operate the way we're operating and have the resources to up, update the materials. We would love to be able to extend into lower grade levels. You know, social studies and civics education isn't just at the high school level. It really starts at the middle school level. Um, and we, about 20% of the teachers, this is where, you know, despite having, you know, the numbers don't completely reflect our penetration of the market. Um, but despite, uh, but about 20% of our, of our teachers are teaching at the middle school level and they're having to adapt the materials down to lower, uh, to lower grade levels. Parks and recreation is not appropriate material for fifth graders or sixth graders. It's not, no problem for high school students, but we would love to make things that are perfectly situated for the middle school age. And for that, we need, we need uh, funding to build out that curriculum. It's expensive to build. Once you built it, it's really inexpensive to distribute. So we'd love to be doing middle school curriculum in five years if we can just get the resources for it. We would love to be reaching about double the number of high school teachers. Um, you know, we think that within, you know, within the market or the, the, or the universe of 160,000 teachers, um, we think that at least half of them, if they understand and know about our materials, would, would be eager to use them. Um, and, and the reason for that is because, you know, we started off with a question of facts. And um, there's a lot of criticism uh, of what's being taught in schools. You know, that may be um, the political issue uh, today. That may be what the next presidential election turns on. Uh, it's certainly going to be one of the important issues is who, what is being taught in schools and, and who gets to decide. Um, and people on the right especially are often skeptical, well, the teacher, you know, teachers are bad. We have no evidence of that in our market. Most high school teachers um, are, are, are patriots. They love the country. They're genuinely um, uh, interested in promoting, you know, what we would call more traditional values. They're, ho they're football coaches. They're ba uh, volleyball coaches. Um, they're just looking for good stuff that, they, that, are, that engage their students. And so they're open to material that is objective, nonpartisan, and built around helping students to understand, you know, the core principles of, uh, of this country. And so what we are trying to do is build materials that will uh, allow students to um, you know, understand what does it mean to be an American, and teachers are really responding to that. That's great. Well, Fred Franson, we're really glad that you and Sertel are out there building all of this, and every time I hear about it, I get my head around it a little bit more and, and understand the real value you're adding. Thanks so much. Thank you. I appreciate it. The lessons of history inform the future. When kids, and frankly adults, don't understand the challenges and victories of the past, they can't put today's news into context. We don't learn history and civics and economics just because we might get a question about the Cuban Missile Crisis or the branches of government at a trivia night. These are the foundations on which our current place in history is built. We have to know what is holding it up. As Marissa eloquently put it, we have to find the cracks, the small wedges of opportunity that allow these concepts to get out into the world. 
Both PragerU and Sartell have creatively explored these cracks. And you heard Fred rattle off a slew of other groups doing important work in this social studies space as well. Free to Choose and Fee, both of which have been guests on past Giving Ventures episodes, as well as Foundation for Teaching Economics and the Bill of Rights Institute, and others as well. I hope you'll visit our show notes page at donorstrust.org slash podcast. You can get the links that we talked about in the episode. Uh, And I'd also humbly ask you to subscribe to Giving Ventures if you haven't already in whatever your podcast player of choice is so you won't miss an episode. I really appreciate you listening. This marks the 50th episode that we have done, and it is an honor to do it, and I hope you enjoy it. I'd love to hear your feedback, your topic suggestions, uh, your takeaways from past episodes and places that it has helped you discover. Email me directly at plipset at donorstrust.org. That's P-L-I-P-S-E-T-T at donorstrust.org. I would love to hear from you. We will be back on the second and fourth Tuesday of every month. Until then, thank you for being a giver. Let's talk more soon. Thank you.